Good morning, friends. Steve from uh, Southern Illinois, and it's good to be back with you this week, okay? I apologize that um, I've been absent without leave. Uh, part of that was because my chronic fatigue syndrome has really been acting up, but part of it was because Viv and I were on the road visiting our son for the first time in, well, since COVID struck. But part of it was because I've been really wrestling with this next topic. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to know what was around the next corner? I remember when I was a boy, <clears throat> my brother and I saw this advertisement for this spy gizmo that let you look around corners. You know, there was a tube with mirrors and stuff. And we, we actually tried to build one out of a paper towel tube and and some pieces of glass but we could never get the pieces of glass to reflect right uh, we just really wanted to be able to look around the corner and watch mom and dad without mom and dad knowing what we were doing when I got older I remember the turmoil when I was in college of uh, what career should I choose you know, as a Christian, it was, what is God's will in my life? What does he want me to do? And then there was that, that, that real big one. Uh, is this the girl I want to spend the rest of my life with? Or should I wait for another? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to know whether the bird in the hand is really better than two in the bush until you've got all three in hand. At this stage of life where I'm at right now, uh, those issues are not not uh, consuming, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to know the future. Uh, I'd really like to be sure that um, Social Security is around and um, that, uh, well, Vivian really doesn't want to live in a cardboard box on the street. And you wouldn't believe the pressure that puts on a man when a wife tells you that, okay? We've developed many ways of trying to forecast the future. Reading tea leaves, tarot cards, hiring cult Cons consultants, listening to experts on TV or YouTube. Science is all about foretelling the future. If X and Y are happening, what's the probability of Z? And then there's Facebook. Facebook is full of people asking other people to foretell the future for them. What should I do? What have you done? What was the result of? And that's the crux of our next topic, prophecy. Prophecy speaks to one of the basic cries of our hearts. Understanding whether the future is a safe place to go, knowing what steps to take to get there. Prophecy is an integral part of the lives of the people in the Bible of their spiritual lives because they accepted the possibility of a God who was personal and compassionate and so turning to him for guidance about the future was natural. What effect did that have on their spiritual lives? I spent my devotional time the last three weeks reading, 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 and rereading their stories. And here are my takeaway points. First, prophecy allowed them to be mindful. I know that's a bad word in some Christian circles, but it's a biblical principle. The burden of foretelling the future rolled off of their shoulders, and it allowed them to be present to the people and the circumstances around them all that angst that I had as a young man 
the current concerns that fill our heads and our hearts as we age make it difficult to be present, to be mindful to the situations that we're in, to the people that are around us. We're living in the future, trying to forecast, trying to project ourselves, and that's where our hearts are. Prophecy was the root for mindfulness in the people, the lives of the people in the Bible. Because they had surrendered the future to God, they could live freely in the present. A second, someone else knew the path they needed to take. In some instances in the Bible, in some people's stories, prophecy provided step-by-step -step guidance, detailed specific instructions, positive guidance. Do this. Do that. More often, though, it warned of dangers or the results of behaviors. Negative guidance. Don't do this. Don't do that. And that was often general. In other words, it wasn't speaking to an pers individual person. It was speaking to the human experience generally. It's one thing to know your destination. It's a completely different thing to know how to get there safely, efficiently. I've already shared with you stories of how my family ended up in Nigeria. Prophecy, little p, God's guidance in the life of individuals is something that I've experienced in my own life. And that makes prophecy big P God's guidance in the life of the human race believable to me. And that's the third walkaway point. Prophecy shaped the world view of the people in the Bible because it created a sense of the direction of human history. Humanity, this world, is not going to get sucked into a black hole were wiped out by aliens. Or burned out by a supernova. Okay, there are so many doomsday scenarios that are written into the world view that society holds today. That's not where the Bible is. The Bible has a completely different picture and it's because of prophecy. Wrongs will be righted. Justice will be served. And the world will become a place that is filled with harmony and peace. That is the future that prophecy in the Bible foretells. Now, it's common to attribute optimism to personality. He's an optimistic person. She always sees the cup half full. But when we do that, we ignore the fact that people who have had trauma in their lives are much more likely to see the cup half empty, are much like more likely to see danger around every corner environment and experience have a tremendously powerful impact on our lives. The Bible doesn't promise us a bed of roses. It doesn't even promise us that justice will always be served in this life. What it does promise us is this. God has a future for us. And if we accept his guidance in our lives, if we accept his presence in our lives, he promises us no conditions. He promises us that there we will be part of a happy tomorrow in the future. We just have to play the long game instead of demanding immediate satisfaction. And that confidence, that living within the context of a joyful eternity, transformed the lives of the people in the Bible.
It gave them hope in darkness. It gave them certainty in times of uncertainty. And it can transform our lives as well. Now, a week ago, we were with family, and uh, we were having Friday night worship with a group of young adults. I asked the role of prophecy in their lives. What role does prophecy play in your life? Now, this group, we were none of us were strangers with each other. We're all family, but we weren't on the same page spiritually. We each have had our own spiritual journey. And the conversation that developed among us was powerful for me. Okay? One thing that stood out was how many of us, young and old, regardless of where we were religiously, we experienced a dichotomy between our religious and spiritual experiences when it came to prophecy. For many of us, prophecy was something that we talk about at church or in religious settings. But in the rest of our lives, at work, at school, at home, prophecy really didn't play a role. It was like, oh, you mean it's supposed to? Why would that be? As we talked about it, I heard several answers in our conversation. Prophecy is often approached in a moralist from a moralistic perspective. Now, don't take me wrong, I think morality is good, but mor morality focuses on what is right and what is wrong. And prophecy is often approached from a perspective of identifying what is right and what is wrong. A spiritual life embodies values, purpose, and meaning. A moral life focuses on what is right and wrong. And prophecy rarely touches on values and purpose, meaning the, the essence of a spiritual life. It focuses more on morality than on values, dividing the world into good and evil, rather than serving as a star on the horizon, an ideal that speaks directly into our everyday lives. If it doesn't speak to our lives, how can it be meaningful? Second, many of us were, are burned out on prophecy. There are so many theories running around, so many interpretations, who's right, who's wrong. But more than that, many times, regardless of the interpretation, it's been used as a whip. If you don't get right with God now, this is what's going to happen. Bad things. Be afraid, very afraid, and turn to God. <laughs> it's said that hell has turned more people away from Christianity than any other teaching because people get tired of the whip, and the prophecy is the same way. Okay? As we were talking, though, thought struck me. You know, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a compassionate warning and a manipulative threat. I taught my kids not to use drugs, any drugs. Alcohol, tobacco, street drugs. I did it by warning them of the effects those drugs would have on their lives, on their bodies, on their minds, on their relationships. I also warned them of the penalties that were in the law if they got caught drunk driving or in possession. And they had a choice. They could either hear my warnings out of the f context. They could either frame my, my warnings uh, as being compassion, warning them of danger, 
trying to guide them in a lot to a life that was fulfilling or they could read them as ah, dad's judging everybody around him he's so old-fashioned doesn't he know these things are things everybody does beauty is in the eye of the beholder perhaps the same is true in other areas of our lives and perhaps when we say we're burned out on prophecy maybe it's because of the frame we have put around prophecy and the listening that we've chosen chosen to give it but the third one was more integral okay in order for prophecy to be meaningful in our lives we have to be experiencing God on a personal level God has to be meaningful in our lives and if God is something religious something we talk about in church but basically ignore throughout the week prophecy will be too even as Christians God can be relegated to the religious context this is what a lot of commentators call agnostic Christianity and it's not unique to Christianity it's very common in all religions functional agnosticism relegating God to religious settings to church in a world that denies the reality of God that treats religion as if it's irrelevant or even evil this is a constant threat to my spirituality it biases me towards a materialistic utilitarian ethic do what works grab what you can keep what you kill praise God in church but live life practically the touchstone of prophecy brings me as a Christian face to face with this pitfall because if I find prophecy divorced from my spiritual life could it be that I am a functional agnostic that I'm keeping God in church but holding him at arm's length the rest of the week So no grand story for you this week. Just some real soul searching on my part and some introspection. I've walked away with a renewed commitment towards accepting the touchstone of a personal God who wants to be a part of my life every day in every way. And that's the heart and soul of what prophecy is, was in the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible. Now, looking ahead, prophesying, I see that there are several other topics related to prophecy. And if today's topic forced us to face some of the general questions about prophecy, I have a feeling that those lessons are going to bring us face to face with some more specific elements of prophecy that get down to the nitty-gritty of our lives. I'm looking forward to sharing the journey with you. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. Happy Sabbath to you.